Hi, this is Marcia. And this is Kelly. We are the two U's of Two U's Fiber Adventures. Thanks for stopping by. You'll hear about knitting, spinning, dyeing, crocheting, and just about anything else we can think of as a way to play with string. We blog and post show notes at two U's fiberadventures.com and we invite you to join our two use fiber adventures group on Ravelry. I'm 100 projects and I am better in motion. We're both on Instagram and Ravelry and we look forward to meeting you there. Enjoy Enjoy the the episode. episode. Hi Marsha. Hi Kelly. (laughs) How are you doing? (laughs) Pretty good. Yeah. Good. I hear you had an exciting weekend. I know I did. I have to tell people about it. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) So we will get to knitting, but I I have my friends, Daryl and Wendy, uh, used to live here in Seattle. And in October, they moved to the eastern part of the state, to Spokane, Washington. And for our listeners who are not familiar with the Pacific Northwest, that's on the the far eastern part of the state. And it borders Idaho. It's called the Inland Empire. It's a pretty good-sized city, as you know, Kelly, because you lived there yeah, for a while. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, every year, Wendy and Daryl have a Super Bowl party. None of us are really Super Bowl fans. It's just fun to get together for a party. I think the only time we were really excited about the Super Bowl were the two years that the Seattle Seahawks played. Yeah. But it, it's just fun to get together. And so since they've moved, they invited me over to Spokane to come to the, the party So and then spend a couple of days there. So my plan was to drive on Saturday morning. And it's, I don't know, Kelly's like a five, five yeah, hour drive probably. Yeah, I think something like that, five, six hours. Some, yeah, and I was going to bring um, Enzo with me. So then Wendy called me, I think Friday morning, and said that they were expecting about six to seven inches of snow. <laughs> and... And, and also, you have to go over, well, there's a couple different, but the main route to get over to Spokane is to go over um, Snoqualmie Pass. And that had been closed a couple times, too. So I got kind of panicked, and I also got a little cheap, because I thought, well, I could fly, but I thought, oh, I'll take the train. <laughs> it's less expensive. <laughs> and... Um, so anyway, well, you like I like the train. You've taken the train. I love before. the I I love the train. I don't think there's anything I love more than the train. <laughs> um, but <laughs> the trains in the United States, or maybe I should just say the trains on the west coast of the United States, are not like the trains in Europe. Yeah, I think <laughs> just, I think you could you could generalize to the trains in the United States. Yeah, even on the east coast, I think they're so. as mm-hmm. unreliable. I think okay. so. So I get to the. I, the train was supposed to leave about five o'clock. Well, the, it, it originated in Seattle, but instead of picking it up in Seattle, I just went. It's just uh, a few miles north of where I live. I went up to a, the town called Edmonds, and that's where I was going to pick the train up about five o'clock. And then I was going to get into Spokane about twelve thirty in the morning. And I thought that was fine, you know. And then coming back, uh, this is not the good thing about the train. As I had to be at the train station, I think it left it. 2 30 maybe two o'clock in the morning mm-hmm. so then i would get back about 9 30 in the morning i thought i can deal with that yeah so anyway i get up to the train station my brother dropped me off at in Edmonds at the train station about 4 30 for this five o'clock train and nothing happens nothing happens and finally i and there's people waiting and then all of a sudden i see people leaving make a long story short if the train had been delayed there'd been some sort of derailment or something east of the Cascade Mountains. I'm not sure where. So that delayed the train coming back to Seattle. So the train had to come back to Seattle. It passed us sitting at Edmonds. It went back down to the King Street Station where they then had to clean it. It takes two hours to clean it. And then send it back up and pick us, pick up the the passengers in Seattle, pick up passengers in Edmonds, you know, and then continue mm. on its way to Spokane wow. and stopping along the way. So I thought, okay, I wonder how long this is going to take. Well, it got, it got back to Edmonds at midnight. So I, I did leave about 5.30. I went and I got something to eat, and I came back, and I sat in the train station waiting for the train to come. The good news is I finished the knitting on my Rodeo Drive poncho as I sat there in the station. <laughs> Before you even got onto the train, you finished your right, project. Right, and I had, all, I had my projects all planned, you know, mm-hmm. like what I was going to do. I was going to knit on that poncho. So I finished it. I did not bind it off. When I got onto the train, I finally bound it off, and I and I was tired. But I thought I'm not going to go to sleep until I finish (laughs) binding off this um, this poncho. Anyway, so the train comes about midnight, and then they send us out onto the platform to go get onto the train. 
And but in the meantime, it was we also heard that they had called the Edmonds police because there was there was a woman on the train that was drunk and they wanted to have her removed from the train. So we stand up. So we go out on the platform and then the police say, you can't get on until we get this woman off the train. We stand out there 45 minutes. Oh, my gosh. Waiting for them as they're and We can see them in there, like the police in the car, you know, the train car talking to this woman. And then they come out without her. And we got word that they just decided to leave her on the train. And I felt like I wanted to say, after all that, you left her on the train? <laughs> <laughs> just... But I think what ha- I think you know what people were doing is because there was such a delay, people went out to have dinner and perhaps started drinking mm-hmm. and then had too much. I mean, I went and had a glass of wine, you know, with my meal. So I think probably people had, you know, she obviously had too much. But they and left drinking her on the train. On the tra- yeah, because you can buy drinks yeah. in the yeah in the bar yeah. car. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so finally the train. <laughs> oh, I go to sit down in my seat. That's the, I forgot about this too. I go to sit down cause you have assigned seats. I go to take my seat and there's this woman in the seat next to the window with all of her stuff piled in the seat that I'm supposed to sit in. And she's sound asleep. <sighs> and so I have to wake her up and ask her to move all of her stuff. And then she doesn't want to move all the way over. So I try to sit down in the seat and she's got her thigh like half, like a, like a yeah. quarter of the way on my seat mm-hmm. and she won't move. And I sit down and all of a sudden I'm like, Oh, what's that? And I get up and I realize the seat is soaked with water. <gasps> oh, so, no. I can't, so I have to get the, the car attendant. I was like, I can't sit there because the, there's, like, her water bottle, I think, mm. must have leaked all oh, over the gosh. seat. Or she did it intentionally. <laughs> right, she so wouldn't she, have to anybody sit next to now her. Now, that's a good idea. <laughs> I know. Soak the seat with water. People have, that's an <laughs> evil genius. <laughs> So anyway, the train pulls out of the station at one o'clock in the morning. Oh my gosh! And you and got I, a then seat. I, I got a seat, a dry seat, and uh, I sat next to a woman who, a young woman who never woke up the whole time. Um, <laughs> I think probably, maybe I think I take that back. I think about seven o'clock in the morning she got up to go to the bathroom, but she's just mm-hmm. sat, slept. And I stayed up till about two or two thirty and bound off the my poncho. Yay. And did you have and champagne? <laughs> No, <laughs> I've not had any champagne yet. Oh my gosh! Um, well, so, I have a uh, I have a bottle that we got at New Year's Eve that we didn't drink. We'll mm-hmm. have to use it when you come for stitches. We'll have champagne for your um, for both of our bind offs. <laughs> yes, because yours will be bound off by then. Yes, too, right. Because we have to. We're going to wear them. Yes. <laughs> yes. So. I wake up about 6.30 in the morning. I just have this feeling we must be getting close to Spokane. So I wake up and the car attendant comes through and she says, you know, I know you're getting off in Spokane. We're going to be pulling into the station about 7.45. I'm like, great, you know. And so about 7.35, I get my bag and my knitting and I go down to, um, I wait by the door, you know, because I want to get off and we stop just outside the train station. (laughs) I can see the train station. And we sit there. Oh, no. And we sit there. And we sit there. And then my friend Daryl's now at the train station waiting for me. And so we start having a little text communication. And it says, uh, uh, he starts saying, he starts, the first thing is, I hear a train a coming. It's rolling around the bend. And then I say, ha ha, they, um, they just said we'll arrive at 745. And then this is now an hour and 10 minutes later. Daryl says, do I need to come find you? (laughs) Me. They won't let us off this train. (laughs) Waiting for a freight train to move. I need coffee or drink. Backing into the station now. Hopefully not much longer. Daryl, I had coffee for you, but I drank it. (laughs) Me. I'm about to break through the door and push this damn train into the station myself. (laughs) Daryl, don't you love Amtrak? Me. Usually yes, but not today. Sitting here thinking about flying home. Daryl, feign a heart attack. Go postal. Me, sitting here checking flights. Daryl, sneak out a window. Start cursing. Me, God willing, I'll be off this train before the game. Daryl, Wendy texted me the electricity is out at the house. Me, no, I need a shower. (laughs) Why couldn't they let us off before they do all this messing around connecting another train? Four question marks. Daryl, good point. Complain big time. Me, take me to the Davenport. That's the luxury hotel in Spokane. (laughs) Uh, We're backing up. Looks like we're backing to Seattle. Moving forward. Backing up. Just shoot me. (laughs) Daryl, I'm phoning the conductor now and reporting you're suicidal. They better let you off. (laughs) 
I didn't know what was going on. But what they do is there's a train that leaves from Seattle and a train that leaves from Portland, and then they meet in Spokane and they connect the two trains. And I think what happened, and I think normally they let the passengers off before they do all this connecting, which takes two hours. Mm -hmm. I think what they did is because of the delay of the train, by the time we got to the train station in Spokane, they had to accommodate freight trains, and yeah. we were not on the right track. So they, they, they took the two. So it was. I got off the train about nine forty-five. Oh my so gosh. I'm in it. I'm going. We're going back and forth <laughs> for <laughs> two hours. Station, for two hours because they have to like pull the train forward, <laughs> then they have to back it up, and then they pull it forward, and then they back it up, and then they pull right. it forward. Get on a different track and attach the other. Oh my! And gosh. I think they couldn't. I, this is what I'm guessing is they can't let us off because they don't have the train that we're on next to the. Um, mm -hmm. Even though we're in the station, we're not next to the platform, and so they right. don't. You know, they can't legally let us walk across all the tracks. Right. Yeah. But I. But I was like, I was standing there looking at flights because I thought, I'm flying home. I am not doing this. <laughs> anyway, now the rest of the story. I didn't do anything about it. I was like, Daryl picks me up and we go get coffee. We take, we go back to their house. Um, we talk for a little bit and everything. And then I about, I don't know, noon or so, I went and I get a shower. And then the Super Bowl party is at 2.30. And so Monday morning I get up and I thought, I'm going to just book a flight. And so I go online. I book my flight home on – they wanted me to stay through Tuesday night. Uh, so I got a flight Wednesday morning. And so I booked the flight. I pick up my phone, to, and I'm holding my Amtrak ticket looking for the 800 number to call to cancel when my phone rings. And it's a recorded message from Amtrak saying that my return train has been canceled. There are no, And then it says, there are no alternative routes. Click. <laughs> Like, what would you do? <laughs> okay, oh, my gosh. This is not Europe. No. 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 It, it's, and it's a shame, too. I, I mean, I, I understand our rail system was built for freight, mm -hmm. for freight rail, and the passenger rail is an afterthought. Yeah. But, oh, my gosh, it's kind of a shame because it could be a good system. <laughs> it could be so, it could be such a good system. And and apparently, I, just to finish that, why that was, train was canceled, apparently there was an avalanche in Montana that took oh. out, that either either it covered the track or maybe it damaged the tracks, too. I don't right. know. Right. Well, so, that um, I guess that can't be helped. That's not no. a, a systemic problem. That's right. just a one-off <laughs> yeah, but it is too bad. I was thinking, you know, about just train system, not not just passenger trains, but even mm -hmm. freight trains. Is it's such an efficient way of moving? Uh, or, no, let me let me rephrase that. It could be mm -hmm. such an efficient way of moving, um, right? Uh, product and mm -hmm. people, mm -hmm. uh, just because it's you can move such a, a, a huge amount of goods, yeah, uh, for not for a lot less money than you know planes and cars and. Mm -hmm. And semi trucks and stuff, but you know it. it and, and I do know this, having taken the Coast Starlight down the you know the west coast of the United States down to California to visit you, that there are delays that that passenger trains don't have priority. That that right. freight trains have priority over passenger trains. I do know that. And when you have a compartment like we've done before, you know it's oh you have a delay. It's not that bad because you can move around, sit in the observation car. You can go to sleep. It's a little bit nicer, but this was, it, it, it's too bad that it's so frustrating. But, yeah. oh well, lesson learned. Yeah. Part of the thing when I went there is that there was two yarn shops that, uh, that I wanted to go visit. One of them is called Paradise Fibers. And they have everything, you know, knitting and crocheting supplies, but also weaving and spinning supplies. And I guess I should have done my research because they were closed. <laughs> um. The time, the only, and they opened up Wednesday. And so, but Wednesday was the day I flew home, so I never got to go there. Aww. So they'll have to be, it's another trip uh, back to that. But we did go, Wendy and I did go over and see another shop called So Easy Two. And they had a nice selection of yarn and then a huge selection of fabrics. Um, so lots of quilting supplies. Um, and oh, that was, nice. So I'm not a quilter, but it was just, it was, it was fun to see that. Um, mm -hmm. And huge button supply, too. Kelly, for oh. you. <laughs> <laughs> I bet they didn't have more buttons than me. No, I don't think they did. <laughs> um, and then, but the last thing I'm going to say, which is kind of funny, is I'm on the train going back and forth past the train station, I can see down the street something called the Knitting Factory. 
And I'm so like, I'm looking at this like, oh my gosh, the knitting factory, what's that? You know, it must be huge if it has factory in the name. And then I get online and I look it up and then they were laughing at me when I got to the Super Bowl party because the knitting factory is a nightclub. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, so they have like, it, you know, music venues and sticky, uh, sticky uh, beer soaked floors, that kind of thing. So, <laughs> oh my gosh. How yeah. funny. And one, funny. I wonder why they're called the Knitting Factory. I don't know. It's such a funny name for yeah. a nightclub, the Knitting Factory. But anyway, I, w- <laughs> I got my hopes up. I was so excited. and then. Oh, that's funny. But that was my adventure. But anyway, let me. since I was talking about my pot, poncho, I think I'm mm-hmm. just going to be forward and just talk about my projects. Yeah, um, go ahead. Since I'm sort of on this thing. So as I said, I finished the knitting on the Rodeo Drive poncho. I tried it on um, at Daryl and Wendy's house, and I, and I love it. I have to say right now, I love it. It needs to be blocked because, like, the collar is sort of, you know, curling mm-hmm. and the, the the border is kind of curling up. But I think it's warm and I think it's going to fit really nicely. The you know, I don't know if you remember the pattern, but it actually has um, shoulder shaping in it. Yeah, kind of like um, a raglan sleeve but no kinda, arm. Yeah, yeah, kind of like – and so uh, – I think it's going to be really nice. So um, tonight, um, I'm going to weave in the ends. And I only have two ends to weave in. Just, you know, where I started yeah. and where I finished. Because I did the spit splicing on all of the, when I joined a ball of yarn. So I'm going to weave in those ends and I'm going to block it tonight. That's my... Nice. It's uh, been a so, long time since I had something that only had two ends to weave in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, cool. So that, and then I brought the two projects I brought to work on were my Good Vibes uh, shawl that I'm making with uh, um, Duran Dye Works yarn Mm -hmm. from the Knockers Retreat. I made pretty good progress on it. There's seven bands of lace, and I just started the fifth band. Oh, nice. Yeah, you made good progress. I made pretty good progress on that. I am getting a little nervous, Kelly, um, about yarn. Now, the thing is with this project, you remember the reason why I picked this pattern is I wanted to use up all of the yarn. I wanted mm-hmm. a pattern that just d- didn't use just part of one ball. I wanted to use equal amounts. And I'm getting nervous because the multicolored one, which is not for the lace, it's the, the garter stitch, mm-hmm. I have about a two inch ball. And the lace, I have about a three inch ball. Okay. And of course, I'm, I'm getting nervous, but. I think it'll be okay. Yeah. But I am getting nervous. Well, and worst said, case scenario, just do a little less of the garter stitch. Yeah. Well, I don't know if that'll work because I'm done with the main garter stitch that's up near the neck of the shawl. And mm-hmm. now it's just four rows of garter stitch between the lace panels. Oh, right. So if I, if I don't do all that garter stitch, it might look a little odd. I don't know. Yeah. We'll have to figure it out. Well, and, and and I remember us talking about this before now that you say that because I think I'm going to have a lot of extra. Yeah. Because I bought a whole extra skein that I don't – I'm not going to need all of it. So, so yeah, and, you're welcome to it. Okay. I mean, well, anyway, but, you know, <laughs> the thing is – I mean, it's great to know I have it so I don't have to mm-hmm. worry. But it's also – I probably am going to have enough. Yeah. You know, I just um, – it's just like the ball seems so small. But then I know. Pretty, and the small yeah. ones go fast. It, yeah. It, they start to, it, for a long time when you're knitting, the ball is so large that you're knitting and it doesn't seem like anything is happening. And then mm-hmm. you get to a point where it's happening really fast and you start to panic like, oh my gosh, am I right. going to have enough? Yeah. And then also because it's a, you know, you're, you're knitting, you keep increasing, so mm-hmm. as I get further and further down, it's getting bigger and bigger yeah. and bigger, the shawl. So I'm using it up even faster. Oh, my gosh, hysteria. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but then the other thing you'll think is funny is I needed something to bring uh, that I could knit on during the so- Super Bowl, you know, so I could watch mm-hmm. the game, like I know what's going on, uh, watch the commercials, <laughs> watch the halftime show, and talk to people. So I brought my Pismo Beach socks. Oh, my gosh. Those <laughs> so, haven't seen the light of day in a while. <laughs> no, but they've been everywhere, right? So now they've been to Spokane. <laughs> <laughs> These are the most well-traveled socks. <laughs> um, so I finished the first sock, and I, and I cast on for the second one, and I've done the rib in about... I don't know. It's sitting here. Um, I've done two inches probably okay. of the of this just the stock in it of you know for the the ankle part. And reminds people about the yarn. Yes, I don't remember the name of the yarn, but it comes. It's like they've they've machine knit 
a, a square stockinette, and then they've painted it or you know dyed it, and so you just are pulling, unraveling this um, blank, you know, or I don't know what yeah, you call sock it, blank. Sock, this mm-hmm. sock blank. You're unraveling it as you knit. I did post on the years ago when I started the sock. I posted pictures of what the the blank look like um, mm-hmm. before I started unraveling it and the, the socks and the blank don't they don't bear any resemblance to each other at all you know other yeah. than it's the same colors but even the colors sort of seem to change as you're knitting it up because it's just a completely different pattern yeah the way they so. blend makes mm-hmm. the colors look really different mm-hmm. yeah I haven't ever I haven't ever done a sock blank I think it would be kind of fun to knit from one Maybe I'll look for one when I'm at Stitches. Yeah, it's fun. Or, you know, you can, I've seen them too, that you can buy just the undyed Mm -hmm. blank. I mean, truly a blank and then just dye your own. That might be kind of fun. That would be fun too, yeah. I think that's how sometimes people make gradients too, is they uh, then dye that blank and to make a gradient. Yeah, sometimes there's some uh, brands of yarn that you buy that's in a cake that. Uh-huh. You can tell that it came out of a sock blank because it's still mm-hmm. crinkly. Mm-hmm. It's to, I don't know what brand that is, but I have seen that. So cool. Well, you got yeah. you got a lot of knitting done. Yeah, I did. You had a lot um, of sitting. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of sitting and a lot of knitting. Well, and in Spokane, there was a ton of snow. They have about two feet of snow, probably. Wow. Out there in Spokane, there's a lot. So Sunday during the Super Bowl, it snowed like crazy. Big, huge, fat, fluffy flakes. Mm-hmm. And um, I remember when we lived there, one of the years that we lived, we lived there from 1984 to 1987. And one of the years that we lived there, we had like a record number of days of snow on the ground because they have snow. I mean, we would have snow, but it wouldn't stay all winter long. But this one particular year was 61 straight days of snow on the ground. Yeah. And, I mean, I had never lived in snow at all anyway, so it was all it was all record-breaking to me. I'm a California right. girl, you know? Yeah. But, but I remember people being really, like, as soon as the snow started to melt, they were so happy because that was just a long time to have snow just covering everything. And I think this. I mean, this. I think this year is unusual for mm-hmm. them too. They're not. Mm-hmm. Um, everybody was saying that. Yeah, it's, this is not feet. typical to have so much. Yeah, so much. And Daryl and Wendy and I. We talked on Wednesday night. I got home and then they called me just to check on me, and they said that they had had two inches of snow. Wow, uh, so more during the day. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yes, I remember Kelly. You know, I came. I did take the train to visit you once the same time mm-hmm. of year, February, mm-hmm. to visit you and Robert when you lived in Spokane. And it was freezing cold. <laughs> and um, well, and mother, it didn't oh. help that my uh, apartment, our little apartment, didn't have heat. Yes, as I recall, I, it, you were warmer if you went outside and stood in the sun. You're warmer <laughs> than if you stayed in your apartment. <laughs> the only heat in our apartment, the the apartment was sort of jerry rigged, and the electrician had come because we had blown the breaker so many times. The landlady had had the electrician come to look at it and he actually disconnected the electricity because to the heater because it was unsafe. So the only heater we had was the heater in the bathroom, the wall heater in the bathroom. And it was yeah, regularly in the forties in our apartment. <laughs> <laughs> we Those, were the days. Those were the days. <laughs> but I remember that trip. My mother told me I need to bring long underwear. And I'm like, I'm not bringing that long underwear. <laughs> and she's like, no, you need to bring it. And I remember I packed it to shut her up. And you were glad you had it. And I was so glad I had it because I slept in the long underwear, <laughs> a flannel nightgown, socks, hat, yeah. jacket. It was yeah. cold. Yeah, it was cold. But, we had uh, we had ice like on the inside of our windows <laughs> from yes. the condensation that then froze. Yeah, that was a fun. Uh, that was actually a fun a fun place to live. But it was definitely a poor yeah. student's apartment. <laughs> and also, do you remember too? This has nothing to do about the cold, but just about how because we were young and we could do stuff that we can't do now. We went. Because Robert was going to school at Eastern mm-hmm. Cheney, which is Cheney's like how many? I don't know how many miles it is from Spokane. Maybe it's like fifteen or something. 
it's not very far. Mm-hmm. But we went over there, but we had to be there by, after a certain time because the donut shop, you could buy donuts at half price yes. or, or something. There was yes. something. And we, we bought a baker's dozen mm-hmm. of donuts. And if people don't know what a baker's dozen is, that's 13 donuts. Uh, we ate all, all of those them. donuts. <laughs> we ate all of those Three donuts. Three people, 13 donuts. We can't do that now, can we? No, I don't think I could do it. I I really don't think I could do it. Robert and I would regularly go get donuts on Sunday morning and eat a whole dozen between the two of us. I can't imagine. I I just, I can't even. (laughs) Those were the Uh, days. Oh, well. So, yeah. Oh, well. Back to our knitting. So what about your projects? Well, I finished the hats, the pussy hats that I was making for friends at work so those are done Mm -hmm. one of them was a friend who was buying one to give to her boyfriend for his birthday and so i had a deadline for that so i got that done he wanted it he saw pictures of of us and that's so sweet i think think that's very yeah and i have a a great picture of him wearing it and then so those are finished and then my poncho i was able to work on it and it's past the halfway point which is exciting i now am at the point where i have to start putting in buttonholes and i'm going to analyze how how that works tonight because i think i should be able to do that i have a i have a work retreat on saturday and so a math department meeting and i think i should be able to knit during during that if I have kind of planned ahead about how the buttonholes work, I should be able to do that mm-hmm. while I'm at the meeting. So I'm hoping, I'm hoping to get all the way to the color work on that. I won't do the color stranding, you know, the, the color changes at work, but mm-hmm. I'll, I'll do that. And then, so I should be able to get to the color work on tomorrow. So I'm, I'm close. I'm getting very, very yeah. close now. And then my cardigan, I picked that back up. The cardigan that I'm doing, you know, sheep to sweater. So that's a gray cardigan. It's the funky grandpa. Mm -hmm. And then it's got stripes that are the same gray wool, but I had over dyed it. And I had Mm -hmm. spun the yarn. The yarn was made quite a long time ago. I think think the yarn was finished maybe in 03 and had just Mm -hmm. been sitting around. In fact, one of the skeins of yarn had a light light damage you know Mm -hmm. to the color Mm -hmm. had a section of it that had faded i used it it worked just fine but uh i I, it's kind of goes to show you how old this yarn (laughs) has been sitting around (laughs) in a basket i had been planning to make a blanket out of it when i spun it and then i decided a woven blanket and then i decided i'm just going to use it for a sweater so i started that sweater last year in january and so I've talked about it a few times on the podcast, but I needed to put the button band on it. I got the button band on, and then there's a I-cord bind off. So I did mm-hmm. the I-cord bind off on the button band. So I think it's I think it's in good shape now. Now I have to do something called afterthought buttonholes, which oh now what's what is that? I I'm not exactly. I'm not exactly sure. It sounds kind of like the afterthought heel where you cut your knitting. But I don't, I haven't read that far to do. (laughs) I haven't read that far on the pattern. But I did finish with the button band and the I-cord bind off. I'm a little bit concerned. I can't tell if it's going to lay nicely after it's, so I'm going to block it again. I blocked it before I did, picked up the stitches for the button band. Mm -hmm. And now I'm going to block it again just to make sure that, the button band will lay nicely. I did not weave in any ends yet because I might need to undo the I cord. Mm -hmm. The button band seemed fine. It was when I put the I cord on it that now it doesn't seem to lay nicely. So I don't know if that will Um, block out or if I need to use a different needle size for the I cord bind off or what. um, I was just going to mention that in the Rodeo drive poncho, Mm -hmm. um, it did say to bind off. I think the, you know, isn't it funny when you finish a project, then you can't really remember all the details. Mm-hmm. I think the whole thing is knit on seven, mm-hmm. but when you bind off, it said bind off with um, holding a, an eight oh. with, in your right hand um, to 
mm-hmm. to make it a little bit looser. And I'm wondering if that's, I mean, it's done now, but if it doesn't lay flat, maybe just, well, I don't actually, I have to back up and say, I don't really know how, I've never done a, a I-cord bind off. So is it something that you could do that, hold a, a larger yes. size needle in your right? Okay. Yeah. What I don't know about it is whether it needs a bigger needle or a smaller one. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I kind of feel like maybe it needs a smaller one, but yeah, I definitely need to, if, if it doesn't lay flat, I'm going to do something different with the needle size to try to make it better. So I'm Mm -hmm. not, I I think it's really nice because it gives some really good stability to the button band. It's Mm -hmm. not floppy. The edge is really, Mm -hmm. is, is really, it's a really nice sturdy edge to the button band. So I really like that. I just don't know what will happen. So I'm going to block it and see if it if it lays flat. And if it does, then I think I'm good. Otherwise, I'll I'll take out the bind off. I really do think that the that the button band part of it is fine. The way I picked mm-hmm. up stitches for that is fine. I just need to figure out what to do about the the I cord. So mm-hmm. if any listeners are familiar with I cord bind off and have an idea about whether or not it's a good idea to use a smaller or a larger needle when you do that bind off, I would really appreciate the feedback because I, I don't think I'm going to get to it right away, but, but I am interested to know if it's going to work. Over a year I've been working on this sweater and partly just because I had to pick up for the sleeves twice. I think I did. I think I picked up for the sleeves three or four times before I finally got it right. And then and then I just didn't want to pick up those stitches for the button <laughs> right. band Right. when yeah. I got to that point. The, it has the I-cord bind off on the sleeves too, which I think is cool. It's a nice pattern. It's the uh, Funky Grandpa by Misson Rilili Rilili. <laughs> I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> I'll put that in the show notes, or you can look on my project pages. Yeah. So when when the when the the funky grandpa and the ohm shawl are done, do you have other projects? In yeah. The well, I have to sew oh. up the octopus. Oh right. That's the big one. I have to sew up the octopus. I have to finish my knocker shawl. I have to figure out what to do about my crochet cardigan mm. that is coming out inside out or looking. Like one half of it is inside out. It's not like I'll be in need of projects. I have things okay. that I need to do. But, oh, and I'm, I'm working on a test knit for Chris, which she's making a hat pattern, and I, I was working on the adult size. Uh, mm-hmm. She had asked for some people to te- if they were interested in test knitting. So, and then I got onto the pussy hats and got distracted. So I have things, yeah. I have one, yeah. two, three, four, five, six projects works in progress and so yeah when i i'll finish two i'll still have four <laughs> <laughs> yeah i'm trying to think what i have uh, when i finish the my shawl i have other things i need to work on too so i i don't really i probably shouldn't start anything else yeah i want i think the first thing i need to finish is the good vibe shawl the one mm-hmm. for the, the knockers retreat because that's coming up in the beginning of april so i really need to concentrate on that i also have the havasu fall shawl i'm working oh on, yeah and the fairfield cardigan uh which i really just stopped on that and that's not good i don't think i may bring it to california with me but it's not something I'm going to work on at the retreat, maybe just at your yeah. house, because it's too, I need to concentrate too much on it. And then remember the striped study shawl. Oh yeah. I need to finish. I'm going to try, I think that would be a good one for, um, just social media. Yeah, it's that just would garter be good. stitch, but that was the one that I had run out of yarn and they, the shop sent me more yarn. So I need to finish those. But anyway, okay. I'm sure I'll start something too. Well, I sort of am itching to start something. I have, else. I have, <laughs> I'm itching to start something too. Uh, but I am resisting. It's a good thing I'm, mm-hmm. I've been busy because I haven't had really had time to, to think through starting something. But one of the things I really want to start, thinking of living in Spokane, living in the Pacific Northwest, is one of those, remember I talked about wanting to have a, is it Cowichan sweater? Yeah, Cowichan. Cowichan sweater. 
And I just, I coveted those when we were in college. I could not afford one. They were too expensive. But I, you know, we would go down to the market and I'd see them or I could see them in other places when I was visiting you in Seattle. And I just really wanted one. Anyway, I had been looking at patterns and I have yarn that I've been spinning for one. And uh, Tracy Thumperina actually, actually sent me the pattern Orca Run, the pattern that I'd had in my wish list for my birthday. Mm -hmm. So that was really nice. nice. Yeah. Thank you, Tracy. It was really, it was really nice. And so it's a, it's a couch and sweater. It's by, it's called The Orca Run by Beth Brown Reinsel. And of course that tells you what it has on it. It's got whales and Mm -hmm. then a kind of design, color work design that looks like waves. So stripes, mm-hmm. but in the in the stripe is like a, a a brown stripe with a white kind of wave motif going through it, and then it looks like it has a zipper. It's a traditional. It looks like the traditional style mm-hmm. of cardigan. So it's done in super bulky yarn, which I think is mm-hmm. what I've been spinning out of that CVM. Mm-hmm. So I've got I have the three ply that I've been doing with the CVM, and then I have a bulky that I've been spinning on my Indian head spinner that I'm going to use for this sweater. And then I have a couple of other bulky yarns that I've spun out of, I think, Coopworth, a dark brown and a, another, mm-hmm. another lighter brown. So I've got a few different colors. And I think, I, I, so I think that will be my next sweater after I finish the Funky Grandpa and a few other things. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's kind of my plan. Although I have other things, I have other things sitting in my queue as well. And then there's always stitches where you'll get lots of ideas for things that will I be know. exciting to to make. Maybe I should just wait till I go down there to start something. Yeah, you could. Yeah, yeah, you could work on the things you have, and then you could wait to be inspired at stitches. Mm-hmm. Actually, s- stitches sounds exciting. And dangerous. Yeah. Well, and and I knowing you, I think it will also be a little bit overwhelming. Yeah. The marketplace will be a little bit overwhelming. You might have to just go sit in the lobby while I shop. <laughs> I'll sit in the bar. Marsha, Marsha might have to just have a lie down. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. I sometimes get overwhelmed sometimes mm-hmm. by you know, but uh, yeah. but it's fun. Anyway. It's it's a lot of fun. Oh yeah, no, it, I'm excited. It's, you know, I, I I have to say I usually don't buy a lot at Stitches, but I do get a lot of ideas at Stitches. There's mm-hmm. a lot of stuff to look at to see. You see a lot of people wearing things. I just I get I get really inspired. So mm-hmm. so then I'll come home with about 17 ideas <laughs> of things I want to make. <laughs> so we'll see what, what in, is inspiring this year at Stitches. It will be fun to see. I'm excited. Well, it's coming yeah. up. Not too oh, long. Oh, my gosh. Really, really quickly. So that's all of my projects. I've been, I've been, I've gotten quite a bit done, and I've resurrected some of the things that have been sitting for a while, but... Um, and I'm anxious to get some other things done, but that's the end of my project updates. Well, you've been busy. Yes, I have been busy. <laughs> I have. Um, and actually, some of it has just been work-related or, you know, not not such fun fun stuff. Mm-hmm. And then Aunt Betty has been gone. She's been staying with a friend who had a slight stroke. And so, of course, and I'm, I'm not, uh, I have no right to complain about this when most people have to do these things on their own but so Robert and I have had to cook for ourselves and we've had to grocery <laughs> shop for ourselves oh my goodness your life is so challenging I know oh my god <laughs> <laughs> so so anyway it's just it's been different you know the schedule has been mm, has been yeah. different but last weekend was busy for a different reason because Oh, yes. I want to hear about this. Last week, somebody at Robert's work noticed that there was a beehive inside Mm -hmm. of a pipe, a drainage pipe Mm -hmm. that goes under the road. And Mm -hmm. the bees had taken up residence there, and there was actually a hive. Not not a swarm, but an actual hive with combs. And if Mm -hmm. you follow me on Instagram, you probably saw the picture of the hive. And so 
I had a plan on Saturday that I was going to cut, to do what they call, what beekeepers call a cutout, Mm -hmm. which is where you cut the comb out of the hive and you take it all and you, you put it into the frames that then go into your bee box and bring it home and put it at your own location. So that's what I did last Saturday. It was so fun. Mm -hmm. It was amazing. So... well, and I have a question to ask just before you mm-hmm. talk about this, though. But isn't the that pipe, isn't that a very unusual place for bees to build a hive? I mean, it's not what you think of the, what they want, the yeah. ideal spot. I think, I, I don't think it is the ideal place. Of course, the bees don't read the book. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> they don't always do what, what, what you think they should do. Um, it may be, too, that the pipe had a big weed like a mallow weed Mm -hmm. in front of it that I pulled out. Mm -hmm. And, of course, at this time of year, the mallow weed has died, and it's mostly just a stem with a few leaves. Mm -hmm. But it may have been that when they first moved in that it was much more protected because the weeds Mm -hmm. were high, just the grassy weeds were high, and then this mallow plant that was in front of it was bigger and more leafy and full. So... It may have seemed more enclosed to them in the summer when they when they moved in, which is what I suspect mm-hmm. they moved but based on the size of the hive, I suspect they moved in sometime toward the toward the end of summer, um, mm-hmm. so it might have been more enclosed at that point, but yeah, a, an open pipe it was about I don't know maybe three feet diameter, a little less, mm-hmm. and yeah, so they were not in a in a super enclosed space at all. Mm-hmm. It wasn't easy to get to, but but it wasn't it wasn't super enclosed. Mm-hmm. Although in California, I have seen, not personally seen, but I've seen pictures um, in, from the beekeeping group that I'm in of people in our area who have gone and done a cutout, you know, f- seen a hive, done a cutout from a hive that was just like loose in a tree, not not inside of the trunk, but just like oh, on yeah, a just, branch. Uh, Oh, interesting. Yeah. Hmm. So again, the leaves of the tree are creating a little bit of, of space, but that's I would say that's not normal. Although again, you mm-hmm. know, the bees don't read the book, so what we think of as normal maybe or as not normal is maybe perfectly fine to them. But in a colder climate, I don't think that would happen as much. Mm-hmm. So So yeah, I got my equipment, loaded it all up in the truck, went on Saturday morning to where Robert works and it wasn't you know at, on the edge of the parking lot of his work mm-hmm. and I just parked out there and kind of scoped it out I had to dig the pipe had been filled with a lot of sand and dirt and for me to be able to get something in and under the hive I needed to dig out so I dug out a lot of dirt and then I put in a piece of mm-hmm. cardboard I had to cut the top I, I couldn't reach in and hold it while I was cutting it so mm-hmm. I had to cut the comb off the top of the pipe and I I had I I had a machete I have a I have a machete for gardening and I used that because it was long enough to reach you know it's quite long Mm -hmm. and so it was long enough to reach all the way into the pipe to where the the comb was attached Mm -hmm. and I didn't have to wiggle into the pipe at all i could lay on the outside of the pipe and reach in i was sort of wondering about this so okay this this answers this question (laughs) (laughs) yeah no i did not have to climb into the you know wriggle my way Mm -hmm. into the pipe that was that was Mm -hmm. nice but i did have so i i cut the comb off and this was i mean it took me a lot longer to get ready to do everything than it did to actually do it Mm -hmm. digging out laying out my cardboard, getting my frames ready, because I use rubber bands to hold the comb in the, in the frames. So I got all that ready, and then I was like, okay, now I have to take a deep breath before I do the really scary part of uh, cutting the comb off the, mm-hmm. off the top, because it was going to just fall. You know, I was going right. to cut it, and it was just going to fall onto the cardboard. It was only a few inches, but it was going to fall and disrupt, disrupt bees. So, Mm -hmm. and you have this idea that they're going to fall and then they're all going to get mad and they're all going to be organized and mad and coming after you, (laughs) you know, 
Yes. Like in cartoons, right? Yes. <laughs> in cartoons, they all get together and then they all charge after you. And that's really not what happens. And it, it, and I kind of knew that. I mean, they don't really do that. The the guard there's guard bees that come after you. And if if you really do a lot of damage to a hive, like kill a lot of squish a lot of bees while you're working it. And mm-hmm. and just do do a lot of damage. You can have a number of bees coming after you, but it's not like the whole hive is coming after you. So anyway, I cut the top off, and it fell down onto the cardboard. Mm-hmm. And you know there were a lot of bees flying, but they were just sort of confused, not mm-hmm. mad. And I pulled mm-hmm. the cardboard out of the pipe, and then I picked up the pieces of wax. And stuck them into the frames and, you know, pulled the rubber bands around to hold them on to the frames and then put the frames into the box. And and now you have it. Well, now you have the queen, right? Is she, mm. Where's. Yes. So I. Where is she in this process? I, what, what probably happened is that when it fell, you know, the few inches onto the cardboard. Mm-hmm. I mean, when I say it fell, it makes it sound like a you know big crash. It wasn't like that. It was kind of like it just all slumped onto the cardboard. Mm-hmm. When it fell, you know, she doesn't want to be on the outside. So she's on the inside of these layers of comb. And the other bees are kind of around her to, you know, protect her and, and uh, make sure she's okay and to protect, mm-hmm. protect the brood and all of that. And so as I layer, t- took the layers of comb off to put them into the frames, mm-hmm. she probably, when I would lift one up, would go under the next one. And when I would lift one up, would mm-hmm. go under the next one. Okay. I didn't see her as I was getting the frames organized, you know, putting them into the, putting the comb into the frames and putting the frames into the box. I didn't see her. And I was not in the right mind space to actually be looking I'd kind of decided I wasn't going to be able to look for her and concentrate on what I was doing at the same time yeah but once I got them all in I was just I just happened to be looking and she was walking along the edge of the box which I thought was kind of unusual but I think because she was on the last piece that I put in and so she was just walking along the edge of the box with the rest of the bees kind of following around her. I happened to see her. And so I just took my hand and kind of put it on the edge of the box and covered covered over them a little bit. And uh, she just turned and walked down into the, into the frames, into the hmm. box. So very cool. I got the queen. I got to see her. And it was exciting. And I had the presence of mind not to just say, oh, well, the queen, but to just kind of guide her back down into. Mm -hmm. So that made me feel smart. (laughs) (laughs) Like a real beekeeper. Like a real beekeeper. I actually actually had the presence of mind to think about what I should do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then I let it sit there. I brought my knitting so I could wait. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And everybody, all the bees were flying around you know, a little bit disorganized and disoriented. And I put the the box, the hive box, next to the pipe. And slowly but surely, all of the really active bees, you know, the ones that were flying around, made their way into the box. Hmm. And then we decided not to stay until dark. And so I just came back the next morning. And then the next morning I did discover that there was one piece of comb that I had missed that I hadn't seen that hadn't gotten mm-hmm. cut off the pipe. And so there was a clump of bees on on it. And it was about a fist size, maybe a little mm-hmm. smaller than a fist size clump of bees. And it turned out that the piece of comb was really small. It was maybe two inches. Mm-hmm. But... But whatever bees didn't go into the box were clustered on this piece of comb. So what did you do? With, did you leave that or did you take it with you? I, I didn't want to leave it because I didn't want, I, I just, I thought I want those bees. You know, you want as many bees as you can mm-hmm. to help to raise the colony. Mm-hmm. So I cut them off, you know, same thing, put a piece of cardboard in, lay down, reached in with my machete and cut them off. And they were kind of mad. 
It was interesting, the difference between the bees that were with their queen and these mm-hmm. bees, because they, so now they were queenless. Even though they weren't that far away from the box with the queen in it, mm-hmm. they were queenless. And they were acting kind of irritated. And so I got them. I had a different box. Because I, when we, let me, let me just back up a little bit. When I arrived that morning, I put a, a block in the entrance of the hive so now everybody was in overnight it hasn't you know morning hadn't happened yet it was still before sunrise and so i blocked the entrance so they couldn't come out but then i discovered this other group of bees so luckily i still had all the equipment in the truck i went and got that box i cut them down put them in a different box smaller box closed that one up so they couldn't get out and and so i brought the ones that were happy with their queen in their box and the ones that were unhappy with no queen in that box, mm-hmm. I brought them both home. Okay. And then when I got home, I I opened up the one that had the queen. And a few bees came out, and they brought out some trash. Um, I could see them taking <laughs> out, you know, the dead a dead bee and a dead larva. And, um, they, you know, they just got immediately got busy. The other box, very interesting. I opened it up, and... Of course, it's not that many bees in there. It was, a, like I said, about a fifth size clump of bees. Mm-hmm. But it was like they came pouring out of the entrance. <laughs> I mean, it was just, it was so different, the demeanor of the group of bees that had their queen and the group of bees who were distressed. Mm-hmm. But once they came pouring out, they were right next to the other hive and they realized where they needed to be. And they started marching into the hive and by maybe so cool. Yeah. (laughs) By maybe an hour and a half later, there were no bees in the, you know, the, the unhappy box was empty and Mm -hmm. everybody was in the, in the hive in the happy, in the happy box. Yeah. Yeah. It was, Hmm. it was so amazing. There's two beekeeping experiences that are sort of like the epitome of my beekeeping experience. And one was installing packages when I first got bees. Mm -hmm. Like that was the most amazing experience of my life in some ways. I mean, I'm sure I had other amazing experiences, but that was an amazing experience. And then this was another one. I have to say this has this has to be one of the most amazing experiences of my life doing this cutout? Mm-hmm. Hmm. So cool. <laughs> so this this so this hive that you've just brought home. Where is it in the garden then, in relationship to the other hives that you have? Because you have two, right? No, I just have. Or no, wait, I don't have. This is my only one. Oh, you're because the other ones have not survived. Right. 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 Okay. So I had one location that was a good location, but. It um, is not flat, and I had a little bit of a difficulty getting getting it to be uh, getting it to be flat. So the hive that I got from the swarm in September, I put that in a planted area, uh, mm-hmm. a, a bed where we have lots of other plants, and it worked great in the summer. But what I discovered in the winter mm-hmm. or fall is that when the sun got low in the sky. It, the the hive was never getting sun, and so that oh. location it seemed like a good location, but it and very picturesque. You know, I have a a hive with a copper top, and it's really pretty, and so it was it looked really nice in the, <laughs> in that area of the garden, but just not practical. Uh, mm-hmm. it, it just didn't get any sun because there were too many plants around it, and there just the placement of that bed, um, that area of the bed, it gets sun in the summer, but not as much in the winter. So. Now I have them out in the orchard area, mm-hmm. which I think will work well. The apple trees, when they leaf out, it might be a little bit in the shade, and that's not ideal. You want it to, in our area, it would be good if it was in, actually in sun. But I think it'll be better. I think it'll be okay because it'll it's full sun in the winter, and then in the you know in the sp- sp- summer spring fall before the leaves go down it it won't get as much sun but it won't be totally in shade either so yeah so we'll see it it seems like my yard is big enough that i should have 
you know, wow, I could put them anywhere. But it's been problematic to find a good spot for the hives for me. Well, your your garden is, you actually have a lot of shade in your garden. Yeah. I mean, half the garden is shaded, right, because of the trees or right. that, lower, that lower area. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I think that area is so shady that that isn't a good location. And then I kind of don't want it to be in a place that's super visible from the street or super visible mm-hmm. from the neighbor's yard. You know, I don't, I, I kind of want to be, let's just say that if people don't know you have beehives, they'll never know you have beehives. Right. And so I kind of feel like it's better if, it's better if they're just not noticed. And a lot of people say, oh, you should go to your neighbors and make sure they know and give them honey and all that. And that might be true, but I have such a large yard that they can be far enough away from people that they would never know we had bees in the yard. Mm-hmm. And even close, even close to the hive, if there's not a lot, you know, if, if unless you're working the hive and doing something that's disrupting them, you would never know. Yeah. You know, so anyway, that's, that, it's been it's been an interesting issue trying to decide where to locate the hive. And then the other thing is areas that you think will be perfect aren't perfect for doing the work you need to do. Mm -hmm. Or they aren't perfect because the bee's activity then is right in the line of traffic because you might not see them. They're, they're, you know, they're not noticeable. They're not, it's not like you see swarms of bees, right? But you also don't want to be on the highway. Right, be right. you don't want to be right in yes. the middle of the bee highway. <laughs> right, you don't want to put your patio furniture in the middle of the the, the highway. Exactly, or your vegetable garden in the middle where you're going to be working. Right, and you know, it uh, in the highway. Right, yeah. because <laughs> it's not like they're coming after you. But if I right. walk in the wrong part of the yard, I, I try to wear like a hat, uh, like a you know ball cap or whatever when I work in the yard. Because if I'm if I'm working over near the bees and they're just going. They'll like sometimes go really close to my head, <laughs> and I'm afraid they're going to get stuck in my hair. So well, and you have you have the hair that would be easy <laughs> for them to get stuck in. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that is true. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so yeah, I try to keep my hair under wraps so I don't have. I say only a friend can say that, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly so yeah i i've you know i've learned a lot in the last two years and this experience has been this last experience was a really good one and it was the perfect setting because it was on the weekend in a place where there weren't a lot of people Mm -hmm. but i could take a break and go you know tell robert what i was doing and kind of think through what i wanted to do next and then go back out and do the, you know, do what I needed to do. I didn't feel pressured. Mm-hmm. I knew I had time. My equipment was close by. So it was, it was perfect. It just, it worked out really well. So now it's just, I'm feeding them, but they don't seem to be taking any of the food, which means they're getting, I think they're getting nectar. There's food out there. So that's cool. Good. Yeah. It's exciting. It's very exciting. Every time you talk about the bees, Kelly, I always think it, here in Seattle, there's a, a, I think there's a man actually in the Ballard neighborhood where I live that will actually bring a hive and uh, rent space to put a hive in your garden. Oh. And um, uh, I heard about him a couple of years ago, and I actually looked at his website, and he was no longer. He had such a demand for people who wanted a hive in their garden that he couldn't take any more um, customers. But what he, you know, you you host the hive in your garden. Mm-hmm. He comes and maintains everything, and then you get in your payment is you get a couple quarts of honey. Uh huh. Um, and nice. I've always thought that would be really fun to do. Because mm-hmm. um, you know, I, I don't think right now I have the ability to 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 do this. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, just Actually, just to have them to to mm-hmm. to watch is fun. Yeah. Just watching them and yeah. seeing what they do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, very cool. Yeah. So. Well, there's one other thing that I have on my list to talk about. Okay. And right. um, this comes from one of our listeners. I actually had planned to talk about this after the projects, but that's all right. 
It doesn't really matter what order we talk about things, I guess, huh? I know we're not <laughs> we're not too structured. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but one of our listeners, Susan, had uh, messaged me uh, about the plying episode and had a question, mm-hmm. and her question was about. Uh, can I give a little bit more detail about long and short shaft and what that means mm-hmm. in terms of plying? And I think I, I re-listened to the episode because that didn't sound familiar to me. And Susan, I think what you might have meant was long and short staple and what that means about plying and yarn. And mm-hmm. so l- let me just answer that question. So staple is the length of the fiber, so some sheep have longer staple wool than other sheep. So merino is relatively short staple. The CVM that I'm spinning is relatively short staple. And then maybe like a Lincoln or a, a BFL or what's another long staple? Wensleydale is extremely long staple. Mm, yeah. Um, so those are all examples of long staple fibers. And so... When you're plying with a long staple fiber, long staple fiber, the hairs are longer, and so you don't need as much twist to be able to keep it together. And if you twist yeah. those long ones too much, you actually get something really harsh and wiry. Whereas with the short staple fiber, you need more twist to hold it together. And so a Merino will have more twist than, say, a Lincoln. If you were looking at yarns, you would see more twist in a a yarn that was made out of Merino, or you should, than a yarn that's made out of, say, Lincoln. Mm -hmm. But if you have a low twist, a relatively low twist, short staple yarn, you're going to have a lot of pilling. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the considerations when you're looking at yarn, like, for example, the cotton yarn that I talked about in the last episode, you know, if you have cotton yarn that's low twist, cotton is extremely short staple, more, I mean, even shorter than, than merino wool, most -hmm. of it. And so, so having a, a low twist cotton yarn, it's really soft, but I don't think it would be very durable. Yeah. So anyway, I hope that answers the question a little bit more. Unfortunately, in most commercial yarn, you don't know what kind of sheep were used you know, to make the yarn. So I think probably a medium, I would, I would say most commercial yarn that's not specifically one type of sheep is probably a medium staple. Mm-hmm. So you know, a little you, you need some twist, not maybe as much as you would need for a for a cotton or a cashmere is another short staple fiber that ta- you know needs a lot of twist. Camel, like the baby camel down that I had, that took took a lot of twist. Mm-hmm. So those will need a higher twist in them for to be a durable yarn. So I hope that answers your question, Susan. I if if not, if I'm if I'm mistaken and I really did say something about the shaft, I'm not sure what I said. The sh- there is a shaft to a spindle, but I don't think I talked about using a spindle in that episode. I don't typically spindle spin yarn, so I don't think that's what I said. But anyway, let me know if that doesn't answer your question, Susan. I appreciate the question, though. It's great to have feedback from people. I'm happy to. Yeah, yeah to talk more about stuff. Well, Kelly, anything else? Well, thinking of talking more about things, um, people saying they would like to hear more. I don't think we'll talk about it today since we've already gone pretty long, but maybe next episode, there was a lot of discussion on the discussion boards um, about compost. You know, we talked about yes, compost, compost and carbon <laughs> sequestering and yes, <laughs> We love our compost. Yeah, that video. <laughs> yes, I know. If you haven't put, looked at in the discussion thread, Kelly posted probably my favorite video of all time. I'll put it uh, in the show composting. notes, too. I, I don't know. You know, do we have listeners? Uh, I'm curious about this. Do we have listeners who are not at all on Ravelry? I know now that our podcast shows up on YouTube, uh, it may be likely that we find people who aren't on Ravelry. 
otherwise, I think mostly people find us because they are on mm-hmm. Ravelry and find out about the podcast. But maybe we have some listeners who are not on Ravelry at all. If they're not, I highly recommend getting on Ravelry because it's great. But yeah. we'll post the video on the show notes so you can see it because yeah. it's very funny. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think it is up there with one of my favorite videos. So uh, yeah. yeah. So we'll talk about compost another time. Maybe we'll talk about it in our next episode because we're getting on to spring and vegetable gardens and I need to order some seeds. I haven't thought too much about it. I have I have several pages earmarked mm-hmm. in my seed book, but I haven't thought about actually making an order. So, you know, cool. a seed stash is kind of like your yarn stash. <laughs> The the problem with seeds <laughs> the problem with seeds is that you get so many more seeds in a package. It's kind of like every time if if every time you made a yarn project a knitting project, you got like two hundred extra yards of yarn, mm-hmm. and then you have all this extra yarn all the time. I mean, mm-hmm. I have extra yarn anyway, but nothing like with seeds. You know, yeah. you you get hundreds in a package, and you only need about seven. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, and depending on what the, what it is, yeah, you know, like yeah. tomatoes, you know, you yeah. get a hundred, and you really only want to have about ten tomato plants. <laughs> Not even. I mean, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, three. Right. Yeah. So yeah, we'll yeah. talk about maybe we'll talk about composting and gardening in the next episode. We have so many okay. things to talk about that. We run, I know. we run out of time. I well, I think we're getting ready to say goodbye. But before we say goodbye, I just want to comment about last episode and the response to last oh, yeah. episode. Because I've been, I was out of town, I've not uh, been very much on Ravelry. And so I am going to go in and respond to people. I have had personal messages and I've responded to those. And I have more that I need to respond to. But I just wanted to thank everybody. There was a lot of very positive comments and a, ro- a lot of really sweet and thoughtful comments that... We received just about my situation, uh, about caring for my mom, mm-hmm. and everything was very helpful. And I know that um, I'm not the only person going through this. You know, yeah. everybody's had to. It was so many people in the same situation or who have had gone through this. And, yeah, people were uh, really it, supportive. Yeah, and then also uh, some comments too about the divorce, and you know, and that was all very positive. And yeah, it just was really nice to hear from people. Yeah, yeah, I just wanted to thank everybody, and I will go in. I will get into Ravelry and start making some comments in the thread and participating a bit more. Um, I need to post my poncho in the, in mm-hmm. the poncho, mm-hmm. great poncho along. Um, so anyway, I wanted to thank everybody. It was very nice. Yeah, yeah, it was nice. I, I'm glad that that people were uh, could appreciate where we were coming from in the mm-hmm. discussion that we had last episode. You know, the political. Uh, yeah, the political discussion that we had. And Marsha and I had talked a lot about what we wanted to say and how we wanted to say it and, you know, what was appropriate for the podcast because you are here for the knitting, right? That is yes. that is what yeah, you're here people for. People are here for knitting. Right. And crocheting mm-hmm. and spinning and, spinning. and weaving. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and community. And mm-hmm. so we had talked about it a lot, but it's nice to hear back from people that, you know, that they had seen where we were coming from and, and yeah. were appreciating what we had to say so anyway this is a great community i i I love our listeners (laughs) so nice (laughs) yeah it was uh yeah i feel like uh there's we're friends with people uh that we don't see yeah (laughs) you know they live they live on the other side of the state the country the world Mm -hmm. uh and we're just one big community yeah that's very very nice nice All right. Anything else we have to talk about? I think that's it for now. All right. Then I think we'll say goodbye. All right. All righty. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for listening. To subscribe to the podcast, visit 2usefiberadventures.com. We have links for iTunes, Google Play Music, YouTube, and others. Join us on our adventures on Ravelry and Instagram. I am Better in Motion, and Kelly is 100 Projects. Until next time, we're the two yous doing doing our our part for World Fleece. Fleece.